Okay, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Varak Ketsemanian. I'm a postdoc lecturer at the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University, and I'm the coordinator of uh, TDAC, the Society for Armenian Studies Graduate Colloquium. And today we have with us uh, Emma Santelman and Sean Nonenmaker. Emma is a PhD student in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Michigan. Her research is centered around situations of language, dialect contact, and multilingual multilingualism, as well as the ideologies that arise in such situations and the ways in which these ideologies influence how people use language. Her ongoing projects include a study of the English spoken by Armenian Americans in Los Angeles and the study of the current state of the local dialect in Gavar in current day Armenia. Whereas Sean is a PhD candidate is in the Department of Linguistics as well at the University of Pittsburgh. His research focuses on the relationship between language ideologies and sociolinguistic practices in Armenia and the United States. His dissertation research is a digital and sociolinguistic ethnography of constructed language, direct coded speech, indirect reported speech, and constructed listenership, being completed in partnership with a US nonprofit organization that focuses on LGBTQ plus issues in K-12 schools. And today they will be speaking about uh, purism and moderate language ideologies toward loan words in post-Soviet Armenia, which is the official title of today's session. And without further ado, I'll pass the floor to our speakers today. And I, I think Sean will be sharing the screen. Go ahead, Sean. Yes, thank you very much. Um, bear with me just a second, everyone, to get the screen share going. So before we start, let me just clarify the format. So the speakers will have around 40 minutes to present their, uh, their research, their topping, and then we can have a Q&A session. Does that sound good to everyone? Okay, the floor is all yours. Excellent, thank you. Um, well, my name is Sean Nonamaker and I am a PhD candidate at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and Emma, did you, I, I know we had kind of a fuller introduction. We just but... had introductions. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm Emma, and uh, thank you for the introduction. And um, the title of our talk today is Purist and Moderate Language Ideologies Toward Loanwords in Post-Soviet Armenia. In the spring of 2018, Armenia saw longtime leader Serge Sargsyan replaced by Nikol Pashinyan during a nonviolent Velvet Revolution. The stakes were high in this leadership transition with Sargsyan on the verge of retaining political power by installing himself as the new prime minister. Many Armenians living domestically in the Republic and abroad in the Armenian diaspora were concerned about the likelihood of continued political corruption under Sargsyan, resulting in a wave of support for Pashinyan as the real and symbolic leader of the revolution. A photo from a New York Times article about Pashinyan depicts him wearing a hat emblazoned with the word Duhov, meaning with spirit or courage. A borrowing of Russian duch, meaning spirit or courage, suffix with the Armenian instrumental case suffix ov. That this Russian-Armenian hybrid word should become a linguistic index of a monumental shift in Armenian politics shows the endurance of Russian linguistic influence in the small post-Soviet nation. However, duchov and other loanwords do not settle into Armenian without scrutiny by language planners, scholars, media commentators, and the public. Rather, they become objects of heated debates among commentators who come to occupy one of two positions, a purist point of view, representing a strong desire to replace as many foreign words as possible with Armenian equivalents, or a moderate point of view, characterized by greater tolerance toward at least some types of loanwords. By characterizing the ongoing debate over loanwords in Armenian as the proliferation of ideological contrast across multiple levels of linguistic structure, we ultimately conclude that commentators with differing surface level opinions rely on the same ideological framework and invoke similar reasoning when arguing for or against the use of a particular word. Differences in, differences in opinion, therefore, stem from differing judgments about precisely which words are acceptable, although judgments are often made through varied interpretations of the same criteria. We argue that participation in the Armenian loanword debate is thus often more symbolic than practical, as commentators who disagree about individual words adhere to similar visions of the overarching qualities that the language should possess. 
On the basis of the ideological similarities between opposing commentators, we argue that the function of ideological debates about loan words in post-Soviet Armenia is likewise more symbolic than practical. While post-Soviet puristic practices have thus far had little impact on the actual use of foreign words in colloquial language, ongoing public debates about loan words provide speakers with an ideological basis for evaluating their lexical choices. The constant tension between purist and moderate viewpoints toward loan words sustains popular interest in the Armenian language and its future. Because linkages between language and statehood frequently appear in discourse about Armenian loan words, the debate additionally functions as a symbolic side of resistance to the Soviet past, in which the future of the Armenian language and the future of the Armenian state are intertwined. Our agenda for today's talk begins by providing an overview of previous work on language ideologies in post-Soviet countries, as well as the methodology that we have implemented following some of these studies. We then provide a brief history of Armenian language policy and an introduction to the key concepts of borrowings and foreignisms before characterizing purist and moderate ideologies toward loanwords and offering a visualization of the framework of ideological contrasts underlying the loanword debate. The more analytical part of the talk will move through examples of word level, language level, and register level contrasts, after which we discuss key takeaways related to the sociolinguistic and sociocultural functions of loanword ideologies. Um, it's important to note that modern Armenian has two standardized varieties, Eastern Armenian and Western Armenian. Our analysis focuses on the loanword debate in Eastern Armenian, which for the sake of simplicity, we refer to as Armenian throughout this presentation. We situate this work within a long tradition of linguistic anthropological and sociolinguistic thinking about language ideologies or beliefs about language and the effects of ideologies on linguistic communities. Individuals possess deeply rooted beliefs about linguistic forms, the varieties, whether languages or dialects these forms come from, and the qualities associated with speakers who use them. Language ideologies are not confined to language alone, but naturally shift into ideologies about personhood, authenticity, cultural identity, and many other issues. While beliefs about language are present cross-linguistically and cross-culturally, understanding the historical emergence of specific ideologies and their functions in context requires local specificity. What we will discuss today are some of the specific functions of two such ideologies about loanwords in post-Soviet Armenia and in relation to Armenian sociocultural life. Although we focus on language ideologies in post-Soviet Armenia, numerous studies of language ideologies, including linguistic purism, have been carried out elsewhere in the post-Soviet space. Research into language ideologies in post-Soviet Europe and Eurasia demonstrates that the widespread nationalizing and purifying tendencies of recent decades, part of what sociolinguist Aneta Pavlenko calls the monolingual turn, represent localized and particularized shifts toward ethnic and linguistic homogeneity, a trend with roots in the Soviet project of creating distinct ethno-linguistic and territorial boundaries between groups of people and in the linguistic purism and prescriptivist uh, practices of the Soviet language policy of Soviet language policy. Um, linguistic purism in the former Soviet Union and elsewhere has been argued to follow moments of drastic change or social upheaval, perhaps best exemplified by the, the fall of the Soviet Union and the initiation of political movements for independence in successor states. Intense linguistic purism and conservatism has been found to occur in language communities facing adverse political circumstances, such as struggles for independence, and such discourses on language have been argued to have implications for issues of national identity, especially during times of radical social and political change. Previous studies of language ideologies in post-Soviet states have uncovered varying manifestations of purism in accordance with varying local contexts. Uh, Yavorska argues that Ukrainian purism focuses on stylistic and not lexical concerns, manifesting in, quote, negative attitudes toward bookish elements, end quote, and the orthographic transliteration of borrowings from Greek, Latin, or other languages into Ukrainian. Ferguson's analysis of Saka Russian bilingual speakers finds competing ideas of purity. On the one hand, not to taint Russian with a backward language, and on the other hand, to keep an indigenous uh, language of Saka pure out of respect for the language and its speakers, particularly its elders. Post-Soviet concerns with linguistic purism and with language issues more generally are often related to concerns of nationhood and national identity. Brewers in discussing language policy and debates in post-Soviet Georgia emphasizes that both Georgians and minority groups invoke essentializing discourses of primordial connections between nation, territory, and language, which are a legacy of Soviet nationalities policy. 
Argent, in an analysis of illness metaphors around Anglicisms in Russia, finds that the Russian language becomes a symbol of the nation in discourse about Anglicisms, as the, quote, health of the nation, end quote, is linked with the health, excuse me, health of the language, rather, is linked with the health of the nation. Um, although linguistic purism targeting non-lexical elements of language has been described in the post-Soviet sphere, um, and although, as noted above, linguistic purism in post-Soviet Armenia sometimes targets other levels of linguistic structure, various authors have noted that foreign lexical items are the most common targets of linguistic purism. It is for this reason that we focus our investigation of linguistic purism in Armenia on loanwords specifically. In describing the hierarchical system of ideological contrast underlying the Armenian loanword debate, we aim not only to contribute to the existing literature on language ideologies and their connections with other aspects of social and political life in the post-Soviet sphere, but also to reveal the ways in which aspects of widespread ideologies, such as linguistic purism, are manifested in the specific and understudied context of post-Soviet Armenia. Our sociolinguistic methodology is informed by other discourse-focused approaches to the study of linguistic purism in post-Soviet states, such as in the work of Argent, Karamzad, and uh, Sib Gatulina, and Gorham. We focus on publicly available sources that provide commentary on loanwords in Armenian. We consider a range of materials, including academic articles, textbooks, interviews, articles in the online press, blog and social media posts, radio and television programs, and statements published by language regulatory bodies and their critics. Following Karamzad and uh, Sib Gatulina, uh, who describe a process of linguistic purification as practiced by the most vocal community members, and Gorham, who focuses on the discourse of, quote, people in positions of cultural authority, end quote, we limit the scope of our analysis to public commentary and do not consider the language practices of everyday speakers. Following the approach of Argent, we present excerpts that highlight key dimensions of the debate and assemble representative samples to reveal the patterns of interest in our analysis. This discourse analytic method is well suited for considering the relationship between language as a socio-historical uh, socio-cultural and historical practice um, and language as a symbolic um, entity. Several previous studies of language ideologies in post-Soviet contexts have described sets of contrasts that underlie linguistic ideological debates. Yavorska, for instance, discusses how basic cultural oppositions of things like ours versus foreign, traditional versus modern, natural versus artificial, form the basis of language ideologies about standardization of Ukrainian. Similarly, Argent uh, describes a system met of metaphors related to health and illness that underlie debates about Anglicisms in post-Soviet Russian, in which the contrast between linguistic health and sickness becomes the basis for both puristic and anti-puristic arguments. The system of contrast that we identify for Armenian is particularly reminiscent of the metaphors identified by Argent, who points out that the same metaphors are used in arguments both for and against Anglicisms. However, our analysis expands upon the frameworks of ideological contrast described by previous authors by identifying how the same set of contrasts in our analysis, the secondary contrast, which we'll be um, sharing more about soon, are applied simultaneously to multiple lexical oppositions between loanwords and Armenian equivalents, between borrowings and foreignisms, and between good and bad Armenian equivalents, and in discourse pertaining to multiple levels of linguistic structures. So the word level, the language level, and the register level, which, which we'll be discussing. In demonstrating the pervasive nature of this framework of secondary contrast among opposing commentators, we hope to draw attention to the broader symbolic functions of the loanword debate in Armenian society. Um, so we now move into a brief history of Armenian and Armenian language policy. For the purpose of our talk, we divide the history of Armenian language policy into three broad periods, a pre-Soviet period, a Soviet period, and a post-Soviet period. Our analysis focuses on the post-Soviet or contemporary moment, i.e. after 1991, but the preceding two periods provide important historical context. Genetically, Armenian is an Indo-European language which developed from Proto-Armenian to Classical Armenian or Grapar, and then to Middle or Medieval Armenian before becoming codified as Ashkarabar, or a new secular and literary standard in the 19th century. Ultimately, two standards were created, Eastern Armenian and Tsars controlled Tbilisi and Moscow, and Western Armenian and Ottoman Constantinople. Both were made to be distinct from the religious classical language on the one hand, and the vernacular dialects spoken throughout the region on the other. Foreign loanwords, such as from French and Turkish, were translated into the new standard, sometimes through the reincorporation of classical Armenian equivalents. After the mid-19th century, Eastern and Western Armenian gradually spread, aided by the publication of newspapers, literature, and plays, and also through the creation of curricula for Armenian schools based on the new standards.
Um, when Armenia was incorporated into the Soviet Union in the 1920s, a new period of Soviet language policy began. Over time, Soviet language planners oscillated between a position of supporting and promoting national languages and an opposing position of suppressing and russifying them. Soviet era russification affected Armenian as it did many Soviet languages. By the 1940s, 70 to 80% of new vocabulary in the languages of the USSR was borrowed from Russian, especially in formal domains like government, education, science, and technology. In Soviet Armenia specifically, by 1950, the Terminology Commission had approved 18,000 new medical terms, 13,000 new legal terms, and a large number of other new specialized terms, the majority of which were Russian in origin or from other languages but derived through Russian. By the 1980s, a majority of Soviet citizens had received Russian instruction in school or had knowledge of Russian. However, the Armenian public was resistant to Soviet language planners privileging of Russian at the expense of Armenian as exemplified in protest to a 1978 constitutional reform that would have codified Russian as the official state language. The collapse of Soviet Armenia in 1991 was followed by a shift away from Russian and a corresponding reintroduction of Armenian for many public spheres in the newly independent republic. Despite this reaction against Soviet era Russification, the role of Russian in public life has nevertheless been recovering in recent years. In 1993, a state language inspectorate or Lesbi Petakante Shtutyun in Armenian was established to oversee the continued development of Armenian language policies and other terminological issues, such as the place of borrowed words. In the same year, the language law of the Republic of Armenia was passed, declaring that, quote, the Armenian language, which serves all the spheres of life of the Republic, shall be the state language of the Republic of Armenia. The literary Armenian language shall be the official language of the Republic of Armenia, end quote. The law also states that, quote, in official conversation, citizens of the Republic of Armenia shall be obliged to ensure the purity of language, end quote. Linguistic purism has formed the backbone of post-independence language policy with purist uh, officials seeking to replace loanwords with calcs or classical Armenian equivalents. Although the modern strategy of creating calcs has deep roots in Armenian linguistic structure dating back to the fifth century golden age of translation. Dissatisfaction with the perceived lack of progress made by the official inspectorate, which later became known as the language committee, resulted in the formation of an unofficial people's language inspectorate or Lesbi Jokhavortakantashtutun in Armenian. According to its website, the People's Inspectorate is devoted to waging an, quote, unrelenting and consistent struggle against foreignisms, falsifications, violations of the linguistic demands of the Armenian constitution, language law, and other laws and sub-legislative acts, end quote. So to wrap up this brief history of Armenian language policy, we can observe that the 20th century saw the introduction of new anxieties with respect to the relationship between Armenian and Russian, which are reflected in post-Soviet policy decisions and reactions to these decisions. Discourse on loan words specifically in post-Soviet Armenia relies on an established distinction between borrowings or pocharutyun and foreignisms or otarabanutyun. According to an Armenian linguistic dictionary published in 1975, pocharutyun simply refers to words or other material that has been borrowed from another language, while otarabanutyun refers to foreign linguistic material which has not yet taken root in Armenian and which deviates from accepted norms. The commentators in the loanword debate frequently employ these terms, referring to loanwords that are fully integrated into Armenian as borrowings and deeming perceptibly foreign words that coexist with Armenian equivalents to be foreignisms. Similar distinctions between different types of loanwords have been described in other studies of language ideologies in which types of words labeled foreignisms and Armenian discourse are called things like inappropriate loans or barbarisms. As you can see from table one, which shows examples of borrowings and foreignisms, the classification of many loanwords is controversial. The left column shows words which are unquestionably borrowings. These words are no longer perceptibly foreign, but they originate from various foreign languages. The words in the right column would be considered foreignisms by most commentators, as they have well-known and widely used Armenian equivalents, which are given in parentheses. Um, and are recognizably foreign to speakers. Words in the middle column are also relatively recent loan words that are perceptibly foreign. However, many commentators consider the middle set of words to be borrowings rather than foreignisms. Reasons include the current lack of accurate or widely used Armenian equivalents, the fact that many of these words are scientific or specialized terms, and the fact that many Armenian compound words have already been derived from some of them. As the controversial status of many of the words in the table suggests, a word may be considered a borrowing at one point in time and may become a foreignism at a later time 
when an Armenian equivalent is created and propagated. So words like cultura, televisor, and excuse me, respublica were once classified as borrowings, but are now considered foreignisms. One of the first things Emma and I noticed about the contemporary debate over loan words is that commentators tend to equate the Armenian language with the Armenian lexicon in keeping with a lexicalist ideology. Sociolinguists have observed that the word as a linguistic unit is a folk linguistic object par excellence, being an entry point for most speakers without formal linguistic training into discussions of word meanings and word classification. One prominent example of the lexicalist ideology in this specific context is found in the title of a radio show, Menk Yev Mer Barera, um, which is literally we in our words or our words in us. Uh, it airs on Armenian public radio. Though non-lexical uh, foreignisms are sometimes discussed on the show, the show's title indicates a lexicalist perspective where discussion of the Armenian language is achieved first and foremost through an exploration of Armenian words. On this slide, we provide the show's catchphrase, which translates as each word is a world with Vartes Avatisian in the world of words. Um, such a statement likewise underscores the prevalence of a lexicalist ideology. We also found evidence of uh, the lexicalist ideology represented in an online article titled, Every Word is a World, Once the Word is Lost, the World Will Also Be Lost. The article goes on to argue that Armenians are unlucky because the native Armenian word for luck was lost from the language long ago. Both the catchphrase of the show Menke Met Barrera and the title of this article demonstrate that the focus on words as the central element of language is not new in Armenian society, or at least is not understood as new. The quote, every word is a world, is widely attributed to the famous Armenian writer of the late 19th and early 20th century, Hovanes Tumanyan. However, as we can see on the slide, if we look back at Tumanyan's original quote, he actually referenced not only words, but also other levels of language structures, sounds, forms, and styles. The widespread selective remembering of Tumanyan's quote in which words are privileged over other dimensions of language further demonstrates the prevalence of the lexicalist ideology among Armenian commentators. In addition to adhering to a primarily lexicalist ideology, commentators who participate in the loanword debate express two main viewpoints. A purist point of view, which represents a strong desire to replace as many foreign words as possible with Armenian equivalents, and a moderate point of view, which is characterized by greater tolerance toward at least some types of loanwords. Although commentators express vastly different opinions about the status of specific loanwords, all commentators rely on the same basic distinction between borrowings and foreignisms. All commentators also agree that the incorporation of borrowings is a normal part of the development of language, while foreignisms can be harmful to the language and its speakers. Differences in opinion, therefore, stem from differing judgments about which words are acceptable borrowings and which words are unacceptable foreignisms, although these judgments are often made using varied interpretations of the same basic criteria. It is important to note that any given commentator may exhibit both purist and moderate ideological tendencies, sometimes presenting arguments better classified as purist, while other times maintaining a more moderate stance. Thus, it is most accurate to characterize the views of commentators as falling along a spectrum ranging from extreme purism at one end to moderate forms of loanword tolerance at the other end, and commentators at opposite ends of this continuum often rely on the same concepts and reasoning. Despite the fact that most commentators cannot be classified as either completely purist or completely open to all foreign words, the commentators tend to see themselves as part of one or the other ideological camp, expressing negative opinions about the opposite side. According to one purist commentator, uh, more moderate people joke that purism threatens to result in the coinage of absurd equivalents for some loan words, uh, such as the word on the slide here, uh, roughly meaning long round dough, which would be an equivalent for the loan word makaron, meaning pasta. Um, this word, this equivalent is uh, humorously long, um, so it's used to like apparently to poke fun at the purists. Um, on the other hand, com commentators with more purist tendencies are also critical of moderates and more generally of people who use many foreign words in their speech, whom they view as otaramol or um, foreignaholic. Thus, commentators often see themselves as belonging to one side or the other even if their actual expressed views are more nuanced. The debate about loanwords between commentators with varying ideologies pulls together several hierarchically arranged levels of contrast as depicted in figure one. 
The topmost node, which reflects the most basic issue of language contact, is the need to create words or expressions for new concepts and objects. Like in all situations of contact, this basic drive to create a new word has two possible outcomes. The integration of a loan word that already conveys the desired meaning, or the coining of a new word or expression, here called an Armenian equivalent. Uh, Armenian equivalents are typically formed through one of two means, either by creating a calc or a morpheme by morpheme compound with Armenian morphemes or like parts of words, um, or by repurposing an Armenian archaism. The lowest level of contrast in figure one reflects the fact that regardless of whether a novel word is produced through borrowing or the creation of an Armenian equivalent, the resulting lexical candidate may succumb to further scrutiny. Loan words deemed unacceptable or inappropriate come to be classified as foreignisms or otorabanutsyon, while those deemed acceptable or appropriate are classified as borrowings or pocharutsyon. Similarly, Armenian equivalents may be met with positive or negative evaluations. Um, but the hierarchy that we have presented in figure one represents the organizing ideological framework for a much more elaborate set of contrasts that underlie this debate about loanwords. Uh, these three primary contrasts of one, loanword versus Armenian equivalent, two, foreignism versus borrowing, and three, bad Armenian equivalent versus good Armenian equivalent, allow for the proliferation of other secondary types of contrasts at a further three levels. Word level contrasts deal with the status of a given word. Language level contrasts speak to the effects of a word on the Armenian language as a whole. And register level contrasts deal with the effects of a word on the perceived style of speech. Next, we'll move through each of these levels in turn and consider some examples of secondary contrasts within each one. Uh, so, given the fact that commentators mostly adhere to a lexicalist ideology when considering the status of loan words in Armenian, it is unsurprising that the initial and largest set of contrasts pertains to the level of the word. Some word level contrasts are relevant both for the distinction between foreignisms and borrowings and for the distinction between bad Armenian equivalents and good ones. Um, and these are shown in purple on the slide. Other contrasts are relevant for only one of these two categories, and these are shown in red and blue. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of different ones, and we won't have time to go through all of them with examples, but we'll at least show a few examples to illustrate a few of them. So um, this first example illustrates commentators' concerns with how comprehensible words are for the speakers of Armenian. So this is the comprehensible versus not comprehensible contrast. Um, this contrast applies both to loan words and Armenian equivalents in that many commentators will say that a loan word is a foreignism and if people don't understand it, but many will also say that an Armenian equivalent is bad if people don't understand it and good if people do understand it. And so, for example, here where uh, a commentator is concerned that an elderly person might not understand the word image being used instead of get bar, um, this is one case where a loan word is being criticized and considered a foreignism because it's not comprehensible um, as opposed to the Armenian word gerbaj, which is uh, depicted as being more comprehensible. Next, um, this example illustrates the contrast between uh, nonsensical and logical etymologies, um, which is relevant for Armenian equivalents, uh, as they are often created out of smaller parts of words. And as we can see in this example, the commentator is criticizing the etymology of the word yetkahan, which is an Armenian equivalent for the word compositor, which uh, means composer and is um, borrowed from Russian. And uh, he's saying that the, the etymology of this word makes no sense because it's literally like song extractor. And he's asking like, where does the composer extract songs from? Like trying to show that this is a silly etymology that doesn't make sense based on the word's meaning. Um, okay, and this last example actually illustrates a few different contrasts. So here, uh, Harach Martirosyan, who is a well-known professional linguist, is discussing all the nuances that one should consider uh, with respect to both loanwords and Armenian equivalents. And we see here the contrast between words that sound good and those that don't, words that accurately express the desired meaning and those that don't, 
and words that are already widely used and those that aren't. Um, and so these apply both to loan words and to Armenian equivalents. And he's basically saying that in general, when one is considering the merits of either a loan word or an Armenian equivalent, that it's important to consider uh, where the word falls along these several different axes, along these contrasts. Um, okay, next, at a level higher than the word are contrasts related to the imagined effects of a word on the Armenian language as a whole. The first four language level contrasts relate to the distinction between for foreignisms and borrowings, um, and these are in red, while the final two contrasts relate to the distinctions between um, foreignisms and borrowings and between bad Armenian equivalents and good Armenian equivalents, and um, these are in purple. Again, we don't have time to discuss all of them in detail, but we will look at one example. Um, so this example illustrates the contrast between Foreignisms, which are seen as threatening to the language, um, and borrowings, which are seen as not threatening to the language. Um, and so these are two quotes from the same commentator. And in the first one, she talks about how foreign words will limit to the Armenian language, foreign letters will destroy the Armenian alphabet, and in general, all of this will threaten Armenian culture, independence, identity, statehood, etc. Um, and so here we really see those connections that we mentioned earlier that are often made in this discourse between language and these broader um, aspects of social life. Um, and But then in the second quote here, we see that this commentator is not talking about all foreign words when she um, makes those statements in the first quote, and that she thinks it would be wrong to push out all borrowings from the language. Um, she does use the word pocharutun there. Um, so these excerpts show us how some foreign words, namely foreignisms, are considered a threat to the language and to everything that the language stands for, while other foreign words, borrowings, are not considered a threat. Um, and then lastly, because the use of loan words versus Armenian equivalents influences the register to which language is perceived as belonging, our last group of contrast concerns register, or roughly like the style of speech. We have identified four contrasts along which the choice of words, uh, loan words in general versus Armenian equivalents in general, is seen as influencing understandings of register. Though some of these contrasts uh, reflect the situation noted by observers um, in Armenia, for example, informal and vernacular speech is widely recognized as containing more loan words than formal and literary language. Other contrasts such as scientific versus non-scientific or correct versus incorrect reflect commentators' desire to produce and enforce the ideological boundaries of registers more so than they reflect linguistic reality. Uh, but because register is an emergent phenomenon which depends precisely on the social meaning ascribed to language by speakers, these opinions about the ways in which the use of loanwords should be seen as influencing register are just as important as the current descriptive reality of how the use of loanwords is already seen as influencing register. Um, and again, we won't have time to discuss all of these in detail, but we will show one example. So this example illustrates the contrast between a register with many loan words, which is viewed as incorrect, and one with Armenian equivalents, which is viewed as correct. Um, the excerpt is from a television broadcast where people on the street have been asked to produce the Armenian equivalents for several loan words um, with varying degrees of success after which the Armenian equivalents are provided and discussed. Uh, the broadcast is actually called or correct or incorrect. Um, and in this broadcast, it's made clear that the speech containing foreign words is the one that's incorrect. Um, and so in this excerpt, we also see a connection to the contrast between um, like a vernacular versus more formal speech, because um, in the broadcast, it is also noted that um, the foreign words being discussed are ones that have taken root in the spoken language or the vernacular language. Um, so, in summary, by examining loanword debate discourse, our analysis finds that three primary contrasts, one between all loanwords and their Armenian equivalents, a second between borrowings and foreignisms, and a third between acceptable and unacceptable Armenian equivalents, constitute an overarching ideological framework for numerous other secondary contrasts. 
These secondary contrasts in turn function at multiple levels of linguistic structure, the word level, the language level, and the register level. There are numerous types of secondary contrasts related, for example, to acceptability, understandability, Armenianness, accuracy, formality, and even cleanliness. Rather than seeing these numerous contrasts as proliferating in one direction, upward or from the individual or downward uh, or from the society to the individual, they are better viewed as always coexistent, flowing easily across the porous boundaries between levels to suit the particular argument of a give given commentator in the moment. In navigating this hierarchy of contrasts, commentators who participate in the loanword debate come to occupy one of two positions, a purist point of view, representing a strong desire to replace as many foreign words as possible with Armenian equivalents, or a moderate point of view characterized by greater tolerance toward at least some types of loanwords. Our analysis offers evidence of a ubiquitous tension between purist and moderate language ideologies in post-Soviet Armenia, a location that is still under-examined in work in post-Soviet sociolinguistics. Like many post-Soviet states contending with language reforms amidst shifting socio-political, economic, and demographic realities, Armenia is a place where varying viewpoints emerge in contending with the local legacy of Soviet-era Russification. Nevertheless, we find that commentators who disagree on the acceptability of individual words generally rely on the same framework of ideological contrasts that we have described, welcoming borrowings and condemning foreignisms while disagreeing about the specific words that fill those categories and the specific interpretations of the various ideological contrasts underlying their arguments. A commentator's ideological orientation may lead them to different interpretations of available contrasts and differing conclusions about the same lexical item, but individual commentators also exhibit evidence of ideological slippage through claims that are sometimes purist, sometimes moderate. Because of the shared framework of contrast that underlies the seemingly contradictory purist and moderate ideologies, we conclude that the debate between these ideologies serves a largely symbolic function in post-Soviet Armenian society. As mentioned previously, available accounts suggest that the use of foreign words in everyday speech has been minimally affected by the past several decades of state-sanctioned purification efforts. The fact that the discourse on loanwords continues unabated to this day, despite its minimal practical impact, thus underscores our proposal that the loanword debate serves an ideological function that secures the place of the Armenian language as a central element of public discourse. Our methods, which focused primarily on such public discourse rather than on the language use or attitudes of everyday speakers, were indeed well suited for uncovering precisely this type of symbolic function, while the impact of the loanword debate on everyday speakers and their attitudes about language must be explored through a different methodology in future research. The tension produced by public debates between purist and moderate ideologies toward loanwords sustains interest in the maintenance and preservation of the Armenian language. While the framework of contrasts invoked by both purist and moderate commentators provides a roadmap for speakers making and justifying choices about the words they might use. Evidence of the interest in lexical choices that is produced and sustained by the loanword debate is widespread on social media with a prominent example being found in the public Facebook group Maireni Lesvi Dasej, or Lessons of the Mother Tongue. In this group, which currently has over 40,000 members, um, posts in which speakers ask for and discuss possible Armenian equivalents to various foreign words can be seen uh, very often. And we have some uh, examples of this on the slide here. Uh, this interest-sustaining function of the loanword debate shows similarities to the symbolic functions of discourse about language that have been described in other post-Soviet contexts, such as in the work of uh, Rizanova Clark, who discusses how the discourse of linguistic culture in post-Soviet Russia serves as a, quote, locus for the ongoing negotiation of opinions about linguistic cultural forms and the status of a language, end quote. The purist and moderate ideologies identified in our analysis, as is the case with all kinds of language ideologies studied by scholars, allow for the incorporation of explicit linkages between the Armenian language and other aspects of life, history, and politics. Indeed, explicit linkages to themes such as statehood and the preservation of national identity are frequently found in the discourse examined in our analysis. By means of such linkages, concern with the linguistic purity of Armenian becomes a concern not only with the preservation of the language itself, but also with the preservation of Armenian statehood and cultural identity. 
Armenia has a long history of threats from neighboring nations and is still engaged in an ongoing geopolitical conflict with its neighbor Azerbaijan over the status of Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh, a politically autonomous region that was granted to Azerbaijan during the Soviet period. Threats to linguistic safety have often been likened to the most existential of threats. For example, after the genocide committed against Armenians by the Ottoman Turks in the early 20th century, uh, quote, the Russifying language policy of the late Soviet period was interpreted as language genocide, end quote. The interest in the state of the Armenian language generated by the loanword debate thus also sustains interest in pressing societal issues such as the perceived precarity of Armenia's independence. Today, a large portion of signage in the post-Soviet Republic of Armenia, like the sign for souvenirs shown on the slide, appears in three languages, Armenian, Russian, and English. Survey data from 2007 indicates that Armenian citizens consume more Russian media than their counterparts in most other post-Soviet countries and it's often more common to hear Russian words than their Armenian equivalents in colloquial Armenian for words like ice cream or even goodbye. Thus, the debate over different types of loan words and their relationship to Armenian equivalents is a microcosm of a much larger tension between the Armenian language and culture and the outside world, which is still represented in part by the continuing presence of Russian in everyday life. Although they differ in their judgments on individual words, both the purist and moderate approaches to loan words seek to renegotiate the relationship between the Armenian language and hegemonic languages such as English and Russian, attempting to define the place of Armenian in the globalizing world and at the same time resisting the legacy of the Soviet past. In light of the symbolic functions of the loanword debate in Armenian society and the minimal practical impact that several decades of purist discourse has evidently had on everyday speech, we follow several other authors in arguing that linguistic purism is not harmful a priori, but rather can become harmful in particular societal contexts. In fact, purism has been shown to play a role in language revitalization efforts in the former Soviet Union and has been argued to serve as a means of language preservation for minority languages. We thus propose that linguistic purism in post-Soviet Armenia is likewise not inherently harmful but rather is an integral part of a larger ideological framework that fulfills the important symbolic functions that we have previously discussed. In conclusion, our goal in analyzing the Armenian loanword debate is not to deem either the purist or moderate ideology as wrong, but rather to shed light on the specific functions of these ideologies in this socio-historical context. We find that all commentators, despite their differing judgments of individual loanwords or Armenian equivalents, operate within the same framework of contrasts and ultimately aspire to achieve the same goals. Through participation in the loanword debate, they seek to develop an Armenian language that will correspond to the changing socio-political realities of the nation and fulfill its function as a communicative tool in the modern globalized world, while also maintaining the national identity. And um, this is the end of our presentation. These are our references. Um, thank you, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Emma and Sean, for that fascinating uh, presentation. I have a lot of questions. I'm sure the audience has also uh, has a lot of questions. I guess my questions are more oriented towards kind of socio-historical analysis. As a historian, I'm kind of also interested in how these different aspects play out in, in the Armenian society or in Armenia. So I guess I, I, I'll start with uh, my first question and um, or maybe even an observation or a comment. When you say loan words, how far do you go back? So I got the impression that you're dealing mostly with Russian loan words or Russian borrowings. And I was just curious if this language purism that you saw or you see in Armenia also applies to loan words that come from Arabic, Turkish, or Persian, because I personally haven't seen much discussion about these kind of mm -hmm. Persian, Arabic, or Turkish words, because as you suggested, they may be well integrated into the language. So that was, that was my first question or observation. Second, when you when you refer to this ideological framework in which you see this language debate or the discussion about language, what is really the ideology behind behind this? I mean, if we try to unpack this ideology, is this more of an anti 
Russian stance, since we're dealing with Russian loan words or foreign kind of borrowings, or is it something else? Because this really brings me to the issue of the Eastern Armenians and the Western Armenians, because this language purism is really another, let's say, tension or a clash between Eastern and Western Armenians, because it's mostly Western Armenians who try to impose this language purism on Eastern Armenia, try to see Armenia or the Armenian Republic as the last kind of bastion of a pure, clear kind of Armenian language. So I was just curious about these different ideologies that you talk about. And finally, maybe just uh, another question out of curiosity, is there any kind of geographical or socioeconomic basis of these commentators? So if you talk to people from different areas, would that, um, would that, for, uh, would that dictate how they would actually approach the issues of language? For example, the region of Tallinn, Tallinn, where many former Western Armenians have been settled after the genocide, do they have a different approach on, on the language compared to other regions in, in Armenia? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, uh, great questions. I'll start with the first one because I think it will be the fastest one to answer. So in this project, we were really focusing on like public discourse of you know people who have a strong enough opinion about this issue to get on their soapbox and write something on the internet or you know go on tv go on a radio show and things like this so um i think that the discourse here really is probably not representative of the opinions of average people and in fact for example like this summer i was doing interviews um in gavar um and when we would ask people about like foreign words and stuff they they mostly like didn't care very much like about you know using Russian words, like mostly a lot of people think it's fine. So I do, I don't know about specific regional differences within regular people, but I do think that the people, uh, the commentators who were analyzing here, like have a, a different kind of orientation to this issue than the average person, because they are people who are, um, you know, publicly expressing an opinion about this as opposed to just regular people like living their lives um and uh yeah so i'm hoping to you know investigate this issue with different methodology in the future just with talking to regular people um but it's hard to comment on that based on the research that we've done so far um in terms of the first question that you asked, so that was uh, a really great, great question because I think it does, it really highlights um, what the kind of opposition between these borrowings and foreignisms is doing in this debate because we see like a lot of people discussing like, um, you know, some words from like Persian or different like Iranian languages being like, oh yeah, this word is, you know, a borrowing or this, you know, this word has a foreign origin, but we don't even perceive it. We've been using it for hundreds of years. So, of course, it's a, you know, pocharution and it's fine. Like, we didn't really see anybody who was like, yes, we need to get rid of every single word that was ever borrowed from another language. Like, nobody is really doing that. Um, and uh, yeah, there is some interesting, I mean, maybe you also know some more about this than I do I'm not sure, maybe but how um a lot of like colloquial a lot of words that are borrowed from for example Turkish um people don't recognize them as necessarily foreign anymore but they're considered more colloquial um this is discussed also in um I think her I forget her first name but Khazaryan 2020's um thesis about kindergartens in Armenia how um the teachers like correct these kind of colloquial things, but they're also, oh yeah, Sean is saying he thinks it's Lilith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, so she talks about this, how a lot of these like colloquial words that people just think are colloquial were actually from like Turkish. So they're still sometimes targeted by the prescriptivism, but not necessarily from the viewpoint of them being foreign, but just of because of being like colloquial. Um, yeah, and I don't know if Sean, do you want to try and answer the second question? Yeah, um, and and I feel like it may actually 
relate a little bit to this idea of um, loan words coming from other languages. I mean, I, I think that something that we realized pretty quickly is we were sort of scavenging and pulling in as many sources as we could on this contemporary debate over loan words is that there is so much focus on Russian and please Emma correct and, me and Eng English to some extent yeah. too but I mean sometimes it's hard to tell you know because a lot of the Russian words were also like borrowed into Russian from English so it's hard the the line is very blurry mm -hmm. too like what's Russian and what's English but yeah Ma my impression too is, um, and I, I appreciate this question as well, because I think it helps us think through some of this relationship between different sort of like borrowing languages. Um, even in thinking about like loan words from, you know, languages like Farsi or Arabic or Turkish, I, I feel like often discussions of that emerge in the context of discussing loan words from like a language like Russian and sort of making sense of that, right? Or historicizing that, contextualizing it. But the main focus being, you know, what to do with and how to contend with these, these loan words from Russian. Um, and I think that, I, so to, to speak to that second question about kind of what is this ideological framework um, really doing and what is that kind of deeper ideology there? I think that another thing that Emma and I realized is that, I mean, there are all of these contrasts that are sort of circulating around simultaneously, right? And in any given, you know, source, someone might be invoking, you know, one contrast and linking it to something and then, you know, using that as a way of pulling in some other contrast. And so, the, the thing that sort of recurs throughout all of it, which is what we try to conceptualize in, in this sort of like hierarchically arranged um, system is that there are these primary contrasts, these three primary contrasts between um, borrowings and foreignisms between good Armenian equivalents and bad Armenian equivalents, and then between um, Armenian equivalents and loan words in their entirety as like one level of what's happening. And then another kind of level beneath that, that relates to kind of, does this have to do with words primarily? Does it have to do with the Armenian language as a whole primarily? Or does it have to do with something more stylistic or register based? Um, but then obviously as, as Emma kind of walked us through in the examples, within those sort of secondary contrasts or all of these other things related to, you know, correctness versus incorrectness, like cleanliness versus dirtiness. Um, so this was sort of our attempt of like pulling all of that into one place and, and starting to arrange it in a way that kind of makes sense. Um, Cause I, I mean, I definitely see this project also going into the debates about or the campaigns to actually return to classical Armenian orthography, or classical Armenian spelling, because there are also, I wouldn't say many, but some people in Armenia who advocate a return to how Armenian was spelled before the actually Soviet period. So I can see that kind of related to this issue of language purism or the debates about language purity and cleanliness. But I won't take much of the time. So the floor is open for <laughs> questions. Thank you, Emma, and thank you, Sean. Thank you for your questions. Yes, uh -huh. Jennifer. Yes. Jennifer. Hi, thank Hi. you so much for your presentation. It was uh, really, really interesting to hear. I study purism in the Western Armenian case in mm -hmm. the 19th century, so very different, uh, seemingly. But yeah, so we'll, we will love to read your work. And learn more about it again. That. We'll love to read your work and learn more about that period too. It's uh, yeah, it's in, <laughs> it's in thesis form now. Um, but I mean, a lot of the even just the discourses, the terms that you were mentioning. I mean, they're they're the same that I see in the late mm -hmm. 18th, early 19th century. But I'm curious about the language committee that you mentioned mm -hmm. because uh, in my period in my um, work the leaders of these kinds of discourses are yearning for an institution like that. They're trying to mm -hmm. form one and they try multiple times and it never works. So I'm wondering if the, the committee that, uh, that we see now actually has teeth to it, if they 
if they put forth policies, if they have a plan mm -hmm. for how to disseminate these ideas, or if it's really kind of just what I'm seeing, which is aspirational, but nothing mm -hmm. that, that yeah. um, they're working actively to, to change. Yeah, that's a great question. I, yeah, the language committee is so interesting. Um, in terms of like concrete things that they actually do, I think it consists mostly of like policing how people have things written on signs. Like, for example, is it, you know, is the name of a restaurant in English or Russian or, you know, because the, the Armenian, I forget exactly what the stipulations of the laws are, but there are like laws about, you know, how big the Armenian text is supposed to be and stuff like that. So I read an article recently about how they sued a bunch of businesses over things like this. Um, but in terms of more related to the stuff that we're talking about today, they do, they publish a lot of stuff. Like we didn't have any examples of these, unfortunately, in the talk, but they publish a lot of lists of like, um, here's a list of foreign words. Here's a list of their Armenian equivalents that we recommend you use. Um, and they, you know, disseminate these on various, like, uh, you know, newspaper websites, they have a Facebook page, they publish those, and not only loan words, but also, you know, like, again, these, like, correct versus incorrect things of just different, you know, things that are considered correct in, like, standard Eastern Armenian versus their colloquial variants. Um, so, yeah, they do have a lot of media output. Um, as far as I know, the most concrete thing they do is all those lawsuits. Um, but there could be there could be other things they do that I'm also not aware of. Um, but yeah, the other the kind of interesting thing that we noticed too while reading like interviews with the current director or like the former director of the language committee was that they're also kind of not like even though they do publish these lists of Armenian equivalents, they're kind of not even the most purist like people we found because they still say things like oh we have to you know we have to start using these armenian equivalents and once they're widely used then they'll become like you know really part of the language so yeah it's kind of interesting and that's why we also see these like you know more more purist people who are dissatisfied with the language committee but also more moderate people who are dissatisfied with the language committee because they yeah i mean everybody <laughs> Everybody is dissatisfied with everybody else in this kind of on this topic, but yeah, great question. They're they're super interesting. I totally recommend following them on Facebook. Thank you. So yeah, thank you for your question. Other questions, comments? I don't see any anyone raising their hands. So I guess uh, we'll just end on that note. Thank you again, Emma and Chan, for this very fascinating discussion and fascinating uh, presentation. And thank you for uh, joining TDUC. Uh, as a reminder, TDUC is a, a platform for um, early career scholars or advanced graduate students to actually present their work or works in progress. So we really, encourage uh, graduate students to apply and have a chance to actually present their work. Thank you. Thank you.